Good afternoon. It's a beautiful day in San Pantriniano, and that's wonderful. It was a beautiful day in Paris this morning when I took a taxi to the airport, and it was wonderful to see that beautiful weather. Except that it was called peculiar weather conditions. Why was it called peculiar weather conditions? Because you could see on the roads there was a pollution peak. And that happens in Paris every time there's good weather now. And not only in Paris, you can look at the uh, map of Europe, you can see that. It's thick, it's red, it covers the south of England, the whole of Holland, the whole of Belgium, and the north of France. And it's not the only place in the world where we see things like this. We see that, I think it's New Delhi, which is the uh, world capital of pollution, we see pictures from Peking, we see pictures from Shanghai. The world, world is polluted, not only the air, the, the sea. There will soon be more plastic in the center of the Pacific than there will be fish. I belong to that strange generation where things changed in a major way. When I was born, I was born in the late 40s. We were rebuilding a world that had been destroyed. But in the 50s, that was a wonderful world. Everything was going fine. Everything was going fine apart from wars. We were in the middle of the Cold War. And war, we don't know what to do with them. It's been 25 centuries since Plato said that we should have leaders who should be philosophers. Or if we get a leader who's not a philosopher, he should become one. That's what he said. And one of the things that philosophers would do, they would banish war, they would find another solution. But anyway, in the 50s, we were happy, or so we thought, we thought that world would be like that forever. When we uh, were drawn the picture of the year 2000, that would only be a magnified 1950s. It would be even better. But then when you got to the year 2000, the picture was different. The picture was, became entirely different. Uh, well, you still had Mr. Greenspan, who was at the head of the um, Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, who he would still say, we are breached altitude, we put the automatic pilot, uh, now we'll be cruising there in altitude and it will be like that uh, forever. But it didn't happen that way. He said that in 2005 and in 2007 and 2008 things went wrong. Why did they go wrong? Well, because we got a very, very strange economic system, as, as you may know. We got a strange economic system. Why is it strange? Well, because you have people who have a lot of money that can, they can lend to other people. And you've got a number of people who don't have enough money and they have to borrow it. And so that happens. And at the end of the process, well, you pay interest or during the process you pay interest. And at the end of the process, the people who were rich in the beginning, they richer. And the people who needed money, well, they still needed and they had to mortgage some, some part of their future by paying some of that money. There is a concentration of wealth there going on in our systems. And it's not special to capitalism. We have that going on forever. We tried to fight that, but we were not too good at doing it. And then what we did at the end of the 19th century, we allowed speculation. People say sometimes to me, they say speculation, that's always happened. That people always speculated, but that's not true at all. Speculation was forbidden until the end of the 19th century. In different places, speculation was allowed. And that made it possible for the people who had money, they started betting between each other. And the loser would lose the money, and the um, winner would win the money. And uh, when that became too painful, and the word in uh, finance is systemic, when then it became too painful for the people to lose that, all that money, then the people came to the rescue, because you couldn't let that whole system fall down. And you know, we have that very, very fragile 
financial and economic system now. Um, you have countries, you have plants, you have uh, organization within uh, with different countries, but you have also transnational, transnational um, companies. And these, as you know, are not too good at paying their income tax. You remember when we uh, interviewed Apple company, we realized that 65% of the revenues of the Apple company was not taxed anywhere. It was not taxed anywhere. Where does that come from? Well, that comes from maritime law. Now we're all living under maritime law, and uh, states compete with uh, transnational companies. Transnational companies, there was a study made in Zurich showing that 140 of transnational companies run and decide about 70% of the economy. And when you look at the people who make decisions for these 140 companies, there's even fewer than that. There's not even 140. That makes the system concentrated. And as you know, concentration means contagion. It makes that when something goes wrong, it can go really wrong. The environment, our economic and financial system, they're not in good shape. You know that the water is rising, you know that the temperature is rising, you know that we're breaking right now the um, cycle of nitrogen, we are breaking the uh, cycle of phosphorus. There's a lot of things going on which is re not really good. We are depleting our sources of energy. Fortunately, we have nuclear energy, except that we have a little problem with nuclear energy. When it blows up, it's very dangerous. And the waste we're making, we're still not sure by now what to do with it. That's a problem we're leaving for the future generations. They'll be even smarter than we are, and they're going to deal with that. And then there's another, there's another problem. It's a major problem. It's not mentioned as often, but it's part of the three-pronged catastrophe that is developing around us. It looked good. It started very well. It started as mechanization. It was very hard to work. It was sometimes very dirty. It was demeaning. We wanted to be relieved from that. So we invented windmills and water mills and so on. We got the machine to help us. Most of us gain money from working. The machines have reached a sage stage of development now where robots are replacing people who are doing manual tasks in plants and software, as you know, is replacing people who are doing intellectual work. Where have all the secretaries gone? Well, the secretaries have not gone anywhere. They, did, they haven't gone to China or Vietnam or Indonesia. No, they were replaced by, by word processing. And that happens all the time. You see these studies, which are being mentioned now, which say that in 10 years, uh, 20 years, 40% of the things we do will be replaced by, by machine. So work is running away. Employment is running away. We're talking now of uh, growth coming back. We see uh, the economy is back without the jobs, without a job. We don't know how to make jobs anymore. We create wonderful companies, corporations, which sell for billions, and they employ 50 people, 80 people. There's no employment for people anymore. And there's, maybe you saw that news, that news that's from three weeks or something like that. There's a, uh, there's a Mr. Andrew Ng. Mr. Andrew Ning was a, um, a star at Stanford University in California. He was a star in uh, artificial intelligence. He's gone. He's gone to China. He was from Hong Kong originally. He's in China. He's working now uh, in China with the uh, company called Baidu, which is the equivalent of Google in, in China. And um, the head of Baidu was very happy that Mr. Ning has, uh, has joined his company. And he made a statement. And the statement is very interesting. He said, we're going to, wake, we, we're going to develop the best artificial intelligence system in the world with the help of the army, with the help 
of the army. You may have seen a number of people like Stephen Hawkins, Bill Gates, are a bit worried about that. This is something familiar to me. At some point in the late 80s, I worked in artificial intelligence. I worked for a British company called British Telecom, and I was part of the team working in artificial intelligence in that company. And then one day, it was in early 1990, we were told that we had never been working for British Telecom, that we had been working for the army. But because of the kind of people we were, they thought it was better not to tell us. Why were they telling us at that point? Well, because it was the end of the Cold War, and the budgets for the army were being reduced, and we had to be told that some of us would not work anymore. This is a situation wherein we have the environment, which is a big, big problem. One meter more of water in the oceans by the end of the uh, century. 4.8, we're told, degrees of temperature Celsius. This will make the world very different. Just open the paper and look at what's going on in California right now. There's no water left. I knew California, I lived there for 12 years. There was still water. Now it's all parched. Now it's all back to the desert and it doesn't look like it's going to change. There's our system, there's our financial system. We want to fix it, we want to fix it, but what do we do? The SEC, the American regulator, works for three years in order to make it impossible that a collapse like in September uh, 2008 uh, happens again. They work on it, they have a plan, they know how to do it. When they show the plan in, two, in 2012, the financial sector vetoes it, doesn't want it, doesn't want it. In the first semester of 2008, beginning of a recession, so the demand for oil goes down, but the price for oil is tripled, tripled over six months. Why? Speculation. Big conference, we're trying to change that to make it impossible to happen again. The oil industry vetoes it and the International Agency for Energy, which is supposed to represent us all, sides with the industry. There won't be any regulation. The CFTC is trying to prevent that there are too many speculators on the uh, markets for um, food. It passes the law. What happens? The speculators go to the court, and so far, they've won. This is the situation in which we are. What can we do? Well, there's one solution that you know, we've seen it recently, it's in a film called Interstellar. Just forget about it all, make big rockets, and let's explore the um, rest of the world and go settle there. You just need to have a wormhole near Saturn, and then you need to have a, a black hole somewhere else, and then you can do it. How are we ready to do that? Well, not really. So we have to find another solution. We have to find another solution. The problem, the problem with human beings is that they're not very good to think in the long run. No, they're not. Why not? Well, we live about 80 years now, maybe 100. We're happy to see our children, our grandchildren, some of us are happy enough to see our great-grandchildren children, and we care for them. We do care for them. But do we, do, do we care for the grandchildren of our great-grandchildren? Mm, that becomes a bit, you know, far in, far in the future. We, don't, we care as much for those as we care for the citizens of Nepal and of the um, people who live in Kathmandu. We do care but not enough to make, make an, an effort. What should we do? We should work on this right away. The problem is immense. Time is running out. We have to find a way to do things differently than we did. I mentioned one possibility, which is that the philosopher, meaning the thinkers, that the people who work on the, condition, on the, uh, on the solutions would have more of an ear of the rulers. When we look at history, and you know, it's Hegel who said we should learn from history, but we have never, never so far have we learned from history. We wouldn't have wars if we had learned from history. The prince 
has never listened to the um, never listened to the philosopher. Uh, we had a few princes uh, who were philosophers: Marcus Aurelius, uh, Emperor Julian. But that's very very few. We need now to change the way we're doing things because time is running out. We won't be able to solve these immense problems we have now. We won't be able to solve them if we don't change the way we do things right now. More and more, we're giving the decisions we have to make, we're giving them to the computers. It happens on the stock exchange every day. It's called high-frequency trading. The decisions we're going to make when we go to a store to buy something or whatever is going to be done by big data, and big data is just the statistical analysis done at a very high scale. We cannot. One company has appointed a robot to its uh, committee uh, for directing uh, the way uh, the way things work in the company. We have to take responsibility again on what we're doing, and we have to change it rapidly. We have to turn to the positive economy, but not in 10 years' time or not in 20 years' time, because that will be too late. The chemists, the chem climatologists, the physicists, they give us two or three generations. And as I said, that seems to be far in the, in the future, because we only live as persons 80 or 800 or or years. But friends, we have to do it now. We can't wait much longer. If we wait longer, there'll be people reading our books. There will be people who will say that, oh, Plato, that's very interesting compared to Aristotle, or the reverse. But these people will be robots, like in the film T Terminator. We don't want that. We want it, it to be our great-grandchildren, and not just robots reading our books. But we have to do it now. Thank you.